and we're live. Five, four, three, two, one. Committee on Community Development, Tuesday, December 15th, 2020. Councilmember Glombeck? Here. Councilmember Ferraletto? Councilmember Rivera? Present. Councilmember Scanlon? Present. Councilmember Wyatt? Here. Council President Pridgen? Here. Councilmember Bowman? Present. Councilmember Nowakowski? Present. Councilmember Wingo? Present. Quorum is present. Okay, from the top, please. Yep. Item number one, Washington apartment pilot. Item's open. Hey, this item is open. Um, not sure if we have a speaker here for this item. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Epstein. I'm one of the managers of Washington Apartments LP. Okay. Um, which of my colleagues had questions? I'm sorry, I don't have the item in front of me. Uh, can can you just describe the project a little bit, uh, Mr. Chair? Okay, of course. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, Washington Apartments is an 82 unit apartment building located in downtown Buffalo on Washington Street between Mohawk and Huron. Uh, it has 51 bedrooms and 32 two bedrooms. It caters to uh, individuals in the city of Buffalo who make 60% or less of the area median income. Uh, we've been open since 2005 and are seeking basically an extension of our existing pilot. So the, the existing pilot, um, the, the reason for the extension is because uh, the regulatory agreement that we entered in with the state to keep the property affordable was for 30 years. And when we originally applied for the pilot, we were told that upon the expiration, there would be a renewal process. And so the, the project is still affordable? Correct, for the next 15 years. Oh, good. We want to keep it affordable. Yes, we do too. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm fine with this. Okay. Motion to approve. Uh, motion is to approve, seconded by Council President Pridgen. Thank you for uh, coming to the meeting. Oh, my pleasure. Item number two, University District, Main Street. Items open. Okay, this item is open. Um, uh, Patrick Mesler is here to speak, I believe. And I'm not sure, is, uh, Mr. Wyatt, is this you? Is this your side of Maine? Yes, sir. And it says this gentleman is here to speak, but it's all related to the school zone camera. So, oh, okay. you know, if he's not here, you know, we have his information, we have his, his statement. Um, okay. But if, if he would like to come in and speak at some point during the meeting, hopefully we'll allow that. Thank you. Yes, Mr. yeah, absolutely. We've got another item and we do have people that are here to speak on that. We are going to limit it to three minutes per person, though, because of the number of people. Um, but uh, we can table this item uh, and go on to the next one. Thank you. Motion to table. Motion to table seconded uh, by Mr. Scanlon. Item number three, property damage from Lake Surges. Items open. Uh, this item is open uh, and this is- We uh, have a speaker on Zoom for this one as well. Uh, Mr. Moss is supposed to be on from Harbor Point. I don't see him on, Mr. Chairman, unless he's one of the phone numbers. Okay. So um, we can table it. Okay, motion is to table, seconded uh, by Mr. Wingo. Item number four, Bailey Ave traffic coming. Items open. Okay, this item is open. Uh, we have a person to speak on this, I believe as well. Or Mr. Wyatt, quest or um, this is from the Glass Company, is are they on the, by one of these numbers possibly? If not, if we can just table it, and if they come on, then we allow them to speak. Okay, thank you. Yep, uh, motion to table, seconded uh, by Mr. Bowman. 
Item number five, concerns regarding BPS distance learning model and reopening plan. Items open. Okay, this item is open. Uh, Mr. Crestus is supposed to be here. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this letter I drafted asks for the superintendent of the Buffalo Public Schools or a representative to appear before this committee today. Uh, we have Dr. Will Caresta, the Chief of Government Affairs for Buffalo Public Schools with us today. I wanna to start by thanking Dr. Caresta. Um, I, I will not speak for the entire council, but I know that whenever I've had an issue and I've reached out to him, he's always been great about getting back to me right away with information. Um, he's always been a great communicator with me and um, I hope that's been the way with the rest of the council. Um, I greatly appreciate it. With this letter that went out, he immediately reached out to my office to confirm that he'd be in attendance today and let me know if I need anything to get a hold of him. Um, so I do want to thank him for always being open and communicating with the council. Um, however, as we all know, there are people who make final decisions within the Buffalo Public Schools and they are not here today. And so I do want to apologize to him if he takes any of the brunt of some of the stuff that's directed at them. Um, at last week's council meeting, I filed a letter which I wrote to the superintendent, which raised concerns I had over what appears to be a lack of a plan to return the children to the, of the Buffalo Public School System to an in-person model amidst the pandemic, despite the fact that school districts throughout the state are doing so. I have major concerns over the scholastic, social and emotional impacts these children will endure should they not return to an in-person instruction surrounded by trusted adults, classmates, friends in the very near future. I have, uh, I've marveled at the volume and the intensity of the response I've received from parents, teachers, and administrators. This type of reaction and as I mentioned, the, its intensity underscores the lack of apparent planning and I would say the lack of communication the Buffalo Public Schools has provided to parents and teachers and administrators. As I mentioned last week, uh, the Buffalo Public School District has had nine months to put together a plan which would return these children to an in-person instruction, which I don't think anyone can argue is a more productive instructional framework. Yet parents remain lost and teachers and administrators have received no guidance, no directives. Don't get me wrong. The task of returning these children to school is a monumental one. I do not deny that. However, with nine months to do so and the staff in, within the Buffalo Public Schools, something should have been figured out by now. So I, I have some questions I'm hoping to, Dr. Karestes could answer. Um, doctor, um, obviously last spring, March, this pandemic was hitting and schools were closed down and everyone agreed that it was the right thing to do. We didn't know what we were dealing with with this pandemic, um, but since then we've learned more about it. In early June, the governor announced that summer school, a return to summer school was okay. Um, the Buffalo Public School says, you know, we don't, we didn't have time to prepare for that and get summer school up and ready. That's fine. Can you tell me why in the six months leading up to it, these kids were not in school in September? Thank you, Council Member Scanlon, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for being able to participate in your committee meeting. Um, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, do you, do you wanna limit my uh, response to three minutes? I know you've got a full agenda. How do you wanna proceed? Um, no, I mean, it just uh, to the best of your ability, if you could just answer the questions, if it needs more time, we'll, we'll play it by ear. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing I wanna say is just respond to a couple of the the characterizations from Council Member Scanlon. He and I do have a, a strong relationship. We've known each other for a while and we work very well together, but uh, I wanna be very clear. If, if I am here at a Common Council Committee meeting, I am representing the Superintendent of Schools. So you're not, you're not getting something lesser, you're getting exactly what the Superintendent would want to be said. Uh, and he cannot be in three or four places at a time. And although he would certainly uh, want to be here, uh, ever since he has announced the reopening, the transition of the reopening beginning February 1st, as you could imagine, he has uh, a very, very busy plate. Uh, so a person like me doesn't come in as a lower standard. He comes in as a full representative of the superintendent. The other thing that I wanna be very clear about 
The superintendent is not an autocrat. He, he doesn't make decisions in isolation from his most immediate stakeholders, which are the Board of Education. And in this particular case, because of the nature of what we are, the reckoning that our community is, is having with this virus, he has a health advisory council and very specifically, he has a medical director who is one of the top infectious disease doctors in Buffalo, Dr. Dennis Quo. And that's, there's a team, there's a team there. So the, uh, that it's very important to understand because to suggest that somehow the superintendent is off on his own, um, you know, uh, and, and that kind of portrayal, not only do, do I find it disrespectful to the superintendent of schools, but it's not true. And my worry is that something like that can be said when it's obvious it's not true. If you just read the press reports, it's very clear that Dennis Quo and the superintendent were closely together and that the superintendent is working very closely with the board. So as far as the, 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 the questions, uh, Council Member Scanlon, that you began to ask, I mean, I, I take issue with your entire representation of the district being non-communicative or unresponsive to parents. We have several reopening committees. Parents are fully vested in those committees participating robustly. There is healthy, productive disagreement in which we try to come together at the end to make best decisions on behalf of children. And so that's the best way I can answer a, a question which was premised on so many things that I personally find very inaccurate. The last thing that, and I think you know me, all of you know me, it's not easy for me to come to a, a meeting of respected colleagues in government and certainly elected officials who are civic leaders and to say something like that. So, but I said it and it's, I said it because I feel very honestly that that's a completely, uh, you know, dishonest characterization of what the circumstances are. I wanna make one final point about when schools closed in March, very important to remember that the superintendent was out first in all of New York State, securing authorization from the board to close schools when everybody, and I mean everybody, was panicked about if Buffalo closes, what will it mean? Everyone else is gonna to wanna to close. And Dr. Cash was not interested in the, in the political fallout of a decision regarding the safety of our students. Just like those considerations are secondary right now. The safety of our students was his first consideration back in March, just as it is now. And when he closed, and then about five minutes later, the governor and other school districts and everybody closed because they realized that this reckoning was coming. Nobody was complaining that, the soup, that Dr. Cash was first out of the gate with closure. I guess to wrap up, what I'd like to suggest is we can absolutely work together on these issues. It's very important to follow what the superintendent is expressing. He wants children back in school. Uh, he says that at, at every opportunity, but he wants them back as safely and as responsibly as possible. He is the first educator in our district to say, of course, in-person learning is the preferred modality for instruction for our students. There's no two ways about that. That's not in question. But we can compensate for learning loss. We cannot compensate for the life-changing effects of this virus if children and teachers get sick. And we cannot compensate for the loss of life as a result of the virus. So those are the considerations that the superintendent uh, the calculations that the superintendent has made. He has the trust and, and full backing of the Board of Education, certainly of the cabinet and of most of the constituents that we come into contact with. But critically, and I think it's something that you should all feel uh, secure about, he has the backing and the constant counsel of the top infectious disease doctor in Buffalo. The community spread is too powerful in Buffalo 
for you to put 34,000 children back in school, 10,000 adults with all of the support staff, and then all of the connectors to those children and those adults. You're talking about putting a $250,000 member conglomerate out into the community when community spread is at its highest. So I wanted to share those initial uh, responses to, count, to Council Member Scanlon's concerns uh, and certainly can take further questions, Mr. Chairman, if you wish. Hey, uh, Mr. Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me just start by saying in no way, shape or form do I think any less of Dr. Karestes. And I think I've made that clear in the past thing that again, we've had a great relation, working relationship. But um, as far as anyone feeling as though it's disrespectful or I've heard from other people, whether it's Board of Education members or other people within the education community, a um, couple people feel that it was insulting my letter. I'm not really worried about it being insulting. I'm not worried about the egos of the, the grownups in the room. I'm worried about the kids getting back into school and the long-term harm it's gonna cause them. Um, as far as um, the communication with the public, if everyone was being communicated to, parents would not be knocking on my, on my door, calling my phone, asking me that they have about what's going on, telling me they have no clue what's happening. Um, so obviously they need to do a better job of communicating. Um, so th there are macro and micro issues that we're facing. And if the Buffalo Public Schools, and I know that Dr. Cash does not operate in a vacuum, but the letter has to be addressed to someone and he's hired as the Buffalo Public Schools superintendent. So that's what it was going to. I know he does not operate in a vacuum, but um, if we're talking about sending all these schools, these children back to schools, Dr., as Dr. Karesti's mentioned, what's the plan? There still does not seem and it be any plan. Whether it could have been for September when the rates were down or um, now we all knew that everyone knew well in advance that there would be an uptick in the, in the cases come fall and winter. Um, we saw schools all over New York State back in school in September and they figured it out. Um, there's been no plan communicated to anyone all along. And that's my problem. But on a, that's the macro issue. On the micro issue, some of those issues, I've heard from parents who have children with IEPs or 504 plans who have not been provided the required adaptive equipment, which is instrumental in the child's learning. Um, when it comes to this February plan, um, have parents been contacted yet? Because I know parents that haven't, that have reached out to me. Have the teachers been informed of how this will work? I know I've spoken to teachers who've been in their classrooms that haven't been cleaned since March. Will there be cleaning days? Will teachers be provided cleaning equipment? Will PPE per be provided for teachers and kids? Um, will there be rules for masks and how they're worn and enforcement, how that will take place? No one's aware of any of that because like I said, the schools have had nine months to prepare to get back into school we haven't seen much of anything. Now, there's a two-week break coming up. And so in a couple of weeks, they're going to pull off this return plan for February. And it doesn't seem like it's gotten off the ground yet. So I have major concerns. In addition to that, I've heard from administrators who have been contacted and told that they have to create a return policy for their individual buildings. How on earth were we And now I, I would agree that they need to have some Insight, provide insight and some information knowing their buildings the way they do, but how return plans can be laid at the feet of those individual administrators when we have people who are paid to run Buffalo Public Schools is fascinating to me. And again, I cannot stress how many people have reached out to me, whether it is parents, teachers, or administrators about the lack of a plan and whether people are insulted or find it disrespectful. Um, again, it all comes back to the fact that there does not seem to be a plan and has not been communicated to anyone. Whether again, that was for September, January, now February, or possibly next fall. No one knows what the plan is. Thank you, Council Member Scanlon. Um, I think there, there's something you and I definitely can agree with. Communication is never done. There's, especially with a large school district, there's always someone 
uh, that is going to need additional communication or we missed. So I, I think you and I do agree, communication is just a nonstop business of any large organization. So uh, to the extent that we can do better, we must do better. We can't leave anybody out and people need to be informed. So I, I, I appreciate your concern about that. I think with regard to plans, there's just a basic misunderstanding about the difference between a large district with 60 schools and a small district with three, four, five, six schools. There is one standard planning template and format that principals were required to complete in a step-by-step -step process that they had to follow. And it's not because there isn't some big district plan. We have to make sure that all of the individual needs of a very diverse school community are met with very precise detail. We can't just produce a 200 page plan, hand it out to all of the schools and say, now you make the shoe fit. If the central office is gonna support each one of our schools, we have to hear from them. So we did give them a very precise step-by-step -step planning document that we needed them to complete so that the central office could be responsive and support each school in a differentiated way so that all of their needs were met. And I would be happy to explain that to anybody because that is what large school, did. We're, we're operating with the state of the art. That is what large districts must do all across the country. You can't just pretend you're in a small suburban or rural school district, hand out a plan and tell principals to follow it. In Buffalo, just about every one of our schools has a very distinct student population, a different set of teacher responsibilities because of that student population, and we have to do it right. So I don't know what it means when people say there isn't a plan. I will make sure that Malcolm gets the link to all of the plans so that you can inspect them and we'll make that available to you. I want you to have it so that you can see what we're prepared to do immediately. Dr. K last thing, Dr. Cash repeatedly told the board back in October, in November, uh, th throughout all of the fall that if the board felt that they wanted to open sooner and they directed him to do so, we were prepared. He made sure that every principal had an approved plan by their associate superintendent, but it wasn't some type of individual loose plan. It was a plan based on a very specific rubric of what is necessary to reopen, not just any school, your school. How do we open your school safely and responsibly? So I, I will make sure that council staff has the link to all of those so that you can see that uniformity. And let me personally make myself available to any parent or staff member who you know, just wants help understanding it, who's reaching out to you. I don't want you to carry that burden alone of trying to explain it. I'll be happy to explain it. Just have them reach out to me. Um. Dr. Christie's, you're talking about large school districts, and obviously, the larger school, the, the, the larger the school district is, uh, the more complicated the plan would be. I'm well aware of that, but I'm sitting here and but not if you not if you do it our way. We tried to make sure that it wouldn't be so out of control, complicated, and that's why we had to bring principals in up front. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, and I'm I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt on the fact that it's going to be more difficult for a large school district to open. My question is if New York City can figure it out and get their kids back in school, why can't Buffalo? I don't accept the premise of your question. First of all, New York City hasn't fully reopened. Every time you turn around, they're under constant threat of closing and they have opened and closed and opened and closed. And a very uh, min a small minority of students are actually back in school in New York. So you, you don't have your understanding of what's going on in New York uh, you know, clear. And the one thing that Dr. Cash, and I really appreciate this level of leadership is that he said the worst thing we could do is jerk our kids around 
where they're in for five minutes, then we have to send them home because even under the governor's revised rules, if you get a certain amount of spread, you got to close that school. Then we have a situation where siblings in one school are closed, siblings in the other are open. We had to have a much more deliberate understanding of how to play the long game, how to do this safely and responsibly and transition our district back open so that we wouldn't make all of the mistakes that New York made. New York City is not the model for school reopening. And, and one last thing, Councilman, we had a, a meeting with the commissioner about a week ago where she explicitly told us before a, a group of distinguished guests, including our uh, regents member, Dr. Catherine Collins and others, uh, Senator Shelley Mayer was there, that Buffalo is a model for virtual learning and she has distributed our virtual learning plan to districts all around the state uh, on the belief that if they're looking for how to do remote learning and how to open safely, Buffalo is the model right now for large districts. If you're talking about schools ping-ponging, you know, again, I'll go back to my very first question I asked. Why weren't we open in September while numbers were way down and they wouldn't have been ping-ponging? I've seen schools that were open September, October, November North, until the most school. Large districts were I'm not sorry, open. hang on, I'm not finished. Yeah, they, but they weren't open. Yeah, they Mr. weren't open. Dr. Cross, just one, one at a time. Mr. Scanlon's got the floor. Okay, thank you. So there are many different types of schools and some schools have been able to figure out to get kids back in, they were back in in September. Now you're talking about ping pong and now the way you're doing it, no one has been in, in person. Why not even plan for September where we knew numbers were down and get the, mo the kids in with the most immediate needs? Dr. Crestus? Yeah, I, I just, unfortunately, Council Member Scanlon and, and certainly with respect, You've, you've just got your facts, um, they're, they're just not accurate. I know that you probably have this information and you believe it to be true, but most large districts across the country absolutely were not open in September. And if they were, they began by experimenting with a hybrid model in which they did not bring uh, all students back. And then they quickly had to close again as soon as spikes were reemerging in, in their communities. So I think Dr. Cash has been very consistent from the beginning. And that is we recognize that our, you know, many constituents did want schools, you know, can we open, can we do this? Can we try it for this amount of time? So we understand that concern and we certainly understand the frustration that parents have experienced. Be believe me, we are not blind to that. And it is a deep concern that we have the level of fatigue and, and frustration on the part of parents, kids and teachers, by the way. Um, everyone wants to get back in school, but it was never at the price of losing one child or losing one teacher. We're not going there. And what we have shared with our colleagues is we're gonna do this when the doctors and the scientists tell us, this is about as ready as you're going to be. And we can support a reopening until our uh, our medical director and our health advisory council and our board together as a team are convinced that we can promise parents the highest level of safety. We're not risking children and teachers because of high levels of frustration. We're just not going to do that. And I, and I wanna just share one thing with you. I was an associate superintendent during the H1N1. If you remember, we lost uh, three children during H1N1. And for years after that crisis, anytime I would run into people who were in leadership with me during that time, not only in the school district, but if you can remember, we all came together as a community during H1N1. And what we always say to each other is, God, there must have been something we could have do done to not lose those three kids. We lost them. And we all believe in our heart that if we would have spoken up, if we would have just been more patient, if we would have been more intentional, um, those three children would be with us today. 
So, you know, a lot of, of our caution, yes, it's based on science, as Dr. Cash has said, it's based on advice from his medical director, but Superintendent Cash, in all of his vast experience, district staff now with our most recent experience with H1N1, many of your colleagues I know were involved in trying to mitigate the effects of H1N1. We're not gonna forget those lessons learned and we're not going into those minefields as easily as we did back then and we lost children. So what I would encourage you to do is Dr. Cash has announced a February one transition. Let's, let's let that work. Let's get behind that. Let's come together and support that reopening. I have shared with you, Council Member Scanlon, and with all of your colleagues, if, if you have constituents that want answers, give them my number. I will talk to them and I will answer their questions as best I possibly can. I want to be a resource for you because you shouldn't have to carry this burden by yourself. But now is the time to get behind what Dr. Cash has established is a safe and responsible way to reopen a district for 34,000 children and 10,000 adults. And I believe we'll all be in a better place as a result of following this path. So I encourage you, get behind it and let's, let's start focusing on February 1st and let's work together. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, um, in reference to your um, time during the, the previous, um, your time as an associate superintendent when you lost children, please do not for one second try to paint me as someone who would jeopardize the well being of children for argument's sake. I have a six year old, a four year old, and a child on the way, and there's nothing more important to me than them, their well being, and I would never jeopardize the well being of a child. You represent, you, you, you mentioned consistency, and I would agree with you, the superintendent has been consistent, and that no one has received any sort of in person instruction this far. And I think that's problematic. And I think it's going to rear its ugly head down the road. I do not think that for one second, you'll be able to make up the lost time with these kids. I don't see it happening. And you say that there's a plan. Share the plan with the parents for when, if you're saying you're going to open full go once the numbers drop down below a certain rate, where's the plan? Let's see the plan. I haven't seen any specifics. I've asked some questions about um, IEPs and equipment being provided. I asked questions about um, um, the schools not being cleaned, teachers noticing rooms that haven't been touched since March. None of that's addressed. So again, if there's a plan, let's see it. And I, I could have staff reach out to you, council member, um, with regard to building, maintenance, special education. I just wrote down the names of staff members and I'll have them reach out to you or your staff uh, this week. They can give you some information. And I will also make sure that uh, I send the link to uh, council staff with regard to the, uh, the approved plans that are ready to go for our reopening. Okay, um, I think that sounds like a plan. Also, Dr. Crestus, if you would be available in two weeks, perhaps as an update um, for this committee as well to share with us uh, uh, publicly what you've also shared uh, with Mr. Scanlon, it would be appreciated. Right, will do. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no further questions, we can table this. Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Wingo, sorry. Fine, thank you, appreciate it. You, you, you basically said what I wanted to just share with everyone. Uh, if, I, if we could have Dr. Cresti just also not just share with the council members what these plans are, what the links are. I'm pretty sure they're somewhere on the district site where the parents uh, can have this information as well so that they know what they can expect come uh, February uh, 1st regarding this transition plan. And then not only just get the links today, but we could then also track the fluidity of the plan so that we can see how things are changing as the, 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 the virus is being less impactful in the community. So if, if that's something that's possible, I'd be really appreciative if we could get that to the parents as well, and then also publish that uh, for the parents. And if I could ask our council staff, uh, Mr. Chair, to share that on our website so that 
we could assist and aid the district in getting that information out because I think that is vital information because once the data is out there, uh, folks now are itching, myself included. Uh, I put three children through the Buffalo Public School System. I got two left. Uh, we are we're very eager to see to see the plan and again too, like I said uh, previously, the uh, fluidity of that plan so that we can see how the plan is changing as the virus and its impacts are changing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, if staff could do that, it would be appreciated. Um, I don't see anyone else. We can uh, make a motion to table this. Motion to table. Motion to table, seconded by Mr. Scanlon. Dr. Crestus, thank you for uh, being here. Next item, please. Item number six, inquiry into school speed zone camera program. Items open. Okay, this item is open. This is the one that we have, I believe, quite a few people here to speak on. Um, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Reese. Uh, Mr. Reese is going to be coming at this from a legal point of view, um, and then it will be open for anyone else, and then hopefully we'll be able to get some of the questions answered. Uh, from Mr. Helfer, from the law department, and uh, others. But uh, Mr. Reese, you have the floor. And just a reminder, um, there are so many people that we do want to try to limit this to three minutes, please. Mr. Reese, you're on, you're on mute. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can we okay. start over? Um, Sorry about that. Welcome. Can, can my clock start again, Mr. Golomba? I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. Thank you for having me. I want to give you this from uh, my percep per uh, perceptions uh, from the point of view of practicing attorney. I had my first hearing on this uh, this last week. I'm 3 and 0. I got three citations dismissed. Uh, the major points are done the same way they would be if you were representing someone um, in a speeding violation in a court where they got a ticket from a police officer. The first one uh, that we had here was notice. And uh, I hope the, 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 uh, a, uh, a statute has been made available to you with some uh, highlighting on it. Uh, and, and if I can draw your attention to the statute, page three, about the middle, it's the, uh, the G section, the very last sentence of it there. It basically says that um, in order to prove that uh, someone got proper notice, uh, 14 days, a manual or automatic record of mailing provided in the order course of business shall be prima facie evidence of the facts contained therein. In my particular case, the individual had not kept the envelope. Nobody keeps their envelopes. Nobody does that when they get their mail today. So they didn't know when notice was. The hearing officer did not have that information available to them. So the hearing officer did not know uh, when notice had been filed. Um, it's up to the city to come up with that, not us. This is a demonstration program um, authorization here. The city, if it complies with this, can run this school zone camera uh, program. But it's not my job to show when that notice was proper. The city could not demonstrate that. Second issue was the camera. On all the citations we had, the camera was listed as null. Uh, that's important because if you look on page one of this, what's highlighted as section two, uh, no photo speed violation monitoring system shall be used in a school speed zone unless on the day it is to be used, it is successfully passed a self-test of its functions. I'm reading from the statute here. Well, the city has got to be able to identify that camera and have a self-function uh, test available at the hearing, as far as I'm concerned. That's their job, not mine. Uh, that wasn't available. It's my understanding that there's some comment been made that somewhere in the infinitesimally small type under the pictures, there's a camera ID. Uh, also, I hope you have available to you New York CPLR 4544, which pretty much uh, should be used as a guide. It indicates that if you've got a consumer contract, it better be in at least eight point type or the court's going to throw it away. I can't even imagine what the, what the point of this type is under these pictures. 
but without a microscope, I'm sure I can't read it. I'm 76 years of age. I wouldn't be surprised if it's not smaller than one point type. So I think every one of the citations that said camera null should have been thrown out. Um, the final point of our hearing was an individual testifying. Um, this was on uh, in front of Canisius. They were going north on Delaware Avenue. And they testified that on the three occasions that they went through, two in one day, by the way, within an hour of each other, the, uh, the beacon was not on. They did not see any kind of flashing. Uh, the hearing officer dismissed all three citations. There was no specific reason given, but I don't think the city is ready to uh, handle the prosecution of these. Uh, there's no city prosecutor there. The information doesn't seem to be available. Uh, the only thing that's saving the city so far is quite frankly that the cost of these tickets is too little for someone to go get a lawyer. Um, and, and since I'm on that point, if this isn't about the money, uh, I wanna propose something to you. How about if we reduce the cost of these tickets to $5? If it's really not about the money and we really worried about are worried about safety of the kids and notifying people, let's see if the program continues to run if it's $5 for these tickets. I doubt that it will. I doubt that the company involved will want to do it. Or as an alternative, how about if we get the state to allow us to increase the cost of these tickets to $500? If that happens, I'll have to hire a team of lawyers to appear at these hearings because that's suddenly enough money that maybe lawyers would get involved. We're just with the $50 ticket, we're just at the sweet spot where I know a bunch of people who got three, four tickets and that I just paid it. I don't know if it was fair or not. I don't know if I was speeding or not. Um, this doesn't have a good smell to it. How much time do I have left? Because I got some other points. Well, actually, you're you're done, Mr. Reese. I was uh, hoping that we would have somebody either from law department or uh, uh, someone else to respond, but we'll go to Mr. Wyatt first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I could just have Mr. Reese respond because he um, sent me an email as it relates to the statute regarding a school on Bailey. There is no school on Bailey. So you, can you just respond to that, Mr. Reese? Uh, yes, the uh, same document I showed you um, uh, or I made available to you. This statute, remember, it's an odd duck. You're, you're using a camera to give a, a moving violation to a car, not a person. It has its own definition of a speed zone. Uh, it's number four on page three of the document. I hope it's highlighted in yellow. That's how, what I supplied. It, I think a fair reading of that is you can't use one of these speed zone cams unless there's a school abutting. Uh, you know, the, the school is abutting that street. Um, the Westminster School on Bailey Avenue does not abut Bailey Avenue. It abuts Westminster and East Amherst. I think from a legal point of view, that camera is illegal and it can't give out any tickets. Now, that school zone might be legal for the normal VNT purposes of a police officer clocking someone or with a radar gun. But for the purposes of the city demonstration program, I don't think that camera can give out tickets legally according to this statute. And uh, it, you've got it available to you, you can see it. It talks about abutting an entrance of a school. There's no entrance of the Westminster School on Bailey Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, I think we have Kavet Chambers here from the Law Department to respond to this. Ms. Chambers or is on. Yeah, according to mine, uh, there's no mute on. So. She has to accept her audio on her device. Otherwise, she's not going to be able to um, speak, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah, it's at, um, central staff said that it looks like she's connected and on. Mr. Yeah, uh, Mr. Wyatt. Thank you. I just want to make a quick statement. I know we have a lot of people that want to speak, um, but I want to just speak to the, the issue. This is this is this has become a really big, big issue. And we probably have about 
a couple of hundred people on Facebook Live because a lot of them have gotten, as what Mr. Reese has said, um, prosecuted and given tickets and they haven't been able to contact the vendor and they haven't been able to get hearings. I mean, there's a litany of issues and I know the administration is gonna come out and say, oh, everything is all fine, hunky-dory. The bottom line is back in March, this common council approved a school zone camera policy. And that policy was very narrow and it was relating to the safety of children, nothing else. And that, that program was from 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning, 2.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. That was it. That's what we supported. That's what we, we said, we want our children to be safe. I know some people may oppose it because of the tickets and all those things, and I truly understand that. But none of us want to allow one child to be harmed and have it on our conscience. So we pushed forth with something. Back in October, the mayor vetoed that legislation. Thus, the, 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 each school had the autonomy to have the school zone camera go for the entire school day. That's not what the council wanted, but the, the mayor vetoed to that, me vetoed that, and that's why we have the situation that we have right now, because this was not rolled out properly. It was rolled out with so many issues. The first time is when people get on October 1st got tickets um, that, you know, it was a test. Then, and there's so many lists of things that people are upset and angry about. And, and we're trying to rectify it. And I thought on November 17th, when we passed the legislation, supposedly for immediate passes, um, that we veto, vetoed the mayor's uh, uh, request, um, we thought that that would fix it because we thought from what we've heard from the residents that we wanted people to be warned in a sufficient amount of time. I spoke and I said over and over again, we have a camera and a beacon right in front of Gloria Parks where a lot of the tickets have been gotten from people and they complain that as soon as I come off of Niagara Falls Boulevard, I don't know that there's a school zone camera. And, and then we asked for the signs to be moved out. We asked the beacons to be moved out because we wanted people to know, number one, one, to be fully aware that they're entering a school zone because it's about the safety of a children of children not about a dollar amount but those things were told to us that they couldn't happen and I was supposed to be on the call yesterday I was trying to get on and I couldn't get on because of whatever reason I couldn't get on but I've been told that everyone thinks this is fine and it's not fine because the residents who are upset and angry are trying to deal with things like Mr. Reese talked about getting a hearing and things like that in the midst of a pandemic. People are still trying to go online and get this information, get a hearing. They said, well, there's no hearing available. I mean, it's just so many, the litany of issues are just so too, too many that we can list. But at the end of the day, I hope that this honorable body will do something um, that will make people comfortable. I, mean, I don't think they'll ever be comfortable now because I think it's gone off the track. People just feel like it's a money grab. All on my Facebook, it's a money grab, it's a money grab, it's a money grab. Well, to this common council, our thoughts were specifically and narrowly focused on the safety of children. Bottom line. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Cavette Chambers, are you able to respond now? Hello, this is Cavette Chambers, Senior Deputy Corporation Counsel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I had to reconnect a nope. different no way. Um, with regards to the program that the council together with working with the administration initiated, what this program does, it is a program that yes, it does identify a specific ticket value to, for enforcement, but by and far the foremost, most important part of this is to ensure traffic safety. So when tickets are issued, that is part of the program. The position that the city is in now is that we have done a study by way through our traffic department to see what compliance looked like. That information was shared already as and publicly shared by way of seeing from the start of March on to now we're in December, how much compliance has increased. So from March, we had around 34%, and now we are at 94% compliance for those um, cameras that are located in the schools that are open. The ability to enforce this means that we have recognized a problem, we have data supporting that there was a problem, 
And the city has now taken steps necessary to um, limit its exposure and ensure traffic safety in those areas, not just for the school children, but for anyone, any motorists, any pedestrians that are in those zones. So that is really what the program is here and it's achieving. Yes, there is a monetary component to it. That monetary component is tied with the program that we've adopted to ensure that traffic safety is being um, administered to the extent that we are able to under the law and to ensure the safety again of pedestrians, motorists and school children. Yeah, I think um, one of the concerns is, uh, and I don't want to uh, speak for my colleagues or for Mr. Reese, but uh, were some of those specific questions that Mr. Reese brought up about the uh, legal issues in regards to the tickets, in regards to where the uh, cameras are located and so forth. Um, would you be able to respond uh, to those questions right now? Um, with respect, I can respond limitedly, um, if that's okay. Um, with respect to the information that's actually contained on the ticket, the information was there that is actually required by law. Um, so the city is in compliance with that information. Um, we have looked at this since it has been brought to our attention and where changes, where the public felt as though information was not available with respect to that null, even though it was actually on the ticket, that has since been remedied is my understanding after speaking with the parking commissioner, that's been remedied with the vendor. So as this is rolling out in any issues that the public brings to our attention, those issues are being addressed. With uh, respect Mr. Helper, to the school- you, Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Uh, Helper with, wanted to speak, uh, uh, unless Ms. Chambers, you have more. No, I'll allow uh, Mr. Helper, I'm sorry, Commissioner Helper to speak. Thank you. Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Helper. No, I, I just wanted to, um, she mentioned that uh, we remedied the null issue and we did uh, relatively early on, probably within about 15 days. Um, Mr. Reese talked about the notice and we, we absolutely all know that the notice legally has to be within 14 business days. Um, I'm glad he brought it to my attention because uh, I will talk to the hearing officers. We do have the mailing affidavits. Um, and uh, if he would have... Uh, my hearing officer would ask for them. I'm sure those tickets would not have been dismissed. Uh, beacons not being on was another item he brought up. Uh, we can prove exactly when the beacons were on. We have a manifest, we have a log of every day. And in terms of no school on Bailey Avenue, if you read the state law, it says a school is considered to be every place of academic, vocational or religious services or instruction for persons under the age of 21 years, except places of higher education. It shall include every child care center, every institution for the care of, or training of the mentally or physically handicapped, and every day camp, New York State law. Uh, that is New York State law that was established when uh, the school zone safety camera program was established. So I trust that clears that up. Okay, uh, Mr. Wyatt. I, I don't I don't think it clears it up. You may state it, but it doesn't clear it up because at the end of the day, Mr. Commissioner, as I sat in front of that um, location where the daycare center is, there's no parents walking across the street. I sat there for an entire day. There were no parents. They were dropping the kids off on East Amherst. And so again, you know, as people complain and they're angry and upset that there's a camera on Bailey Avenue where there's not a school, and as Mr. Reese said, abut it, um, uh, Bailey Avenue, there's a, a daycare center. There, there's no parents walking across the street. And there happens to be two crossing guards at those locations as well. So again, you know, I think in the beginning, we've talked about this, the council wanted to be involved in the rollout um, we were refused that, which is the mayor's option. And it, now we have this problem and it's a huge problem because people are getting tickets at times that are outside of the guidelines with the legislation states. 
Um, they're getting uh, fines that we were told that these fines were supposed to be waived or, um, and people are still getting this information and it's confusing to the public. And we even still have signs up right now as we speak, when we passed legislation back on November 17th, that the times were supposed to be from 7.30 to 9.30, not a single time as, I, as far as I know as from yesterday has not been changed. So this is the confusion and this is the unfortunate situation and why people feel this is a money grab and why when you say something about the law, if we were following the law specifically, I would have thought that the things that were rolled out would have been ro rolled out in a fashion that would have been in accordance, accordance with the law. And it seems as though that hasn't been happening because now we have all these legal issues that if someone were to take us for a class action suit, they would win and we would lose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Paroletto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first off, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I wanted to touch base on the vendor of this program. So first of all, I support, absolutely support the reduced speed limit around schools during pickup and drop off. And I think for the kids walking to school and walking home from school, that absolutely makes them safer. In terms of this specific program. This program started on October 13th, um, which was approximately two months ago. Before the cameras were supposed to be turned on and issuing tickets on October 13th, the vendor sent out hundreds of tickets when they weren't supposed to. Next, they sent out hundreds of tickets to people listing the wrong phone number. So when people were calling the number, it was a sex fantasy line and it was not a number to dispute your ticket. Next, we've heard many reports of people calling to dispute their ticket. The phone calls are not being answered and people are saying that the phone calls are not being returned. I saw on one news report where they called the number and they were literally just getting, just got disconnected without even the ability to leave a message. People are going online to try to request a hearing and there is not an option to get a hearing online right now. So you follow the instructions and it says go online and you are not allowed to do that. We found out that approximately 20,000 tickets were sent out late and therefore those were not in accordance with the law. I've spoken with Commissioner Helfer several times on this over the past few weeks about the issues where people are not they can't get a hold of someone to even get a hearing. And he's informed me that all late fees will be waived for the month of December and no one will have late fees, which I 100% think that that's important and that should be in place. However, I have constituents that have emailed me and I've seen them over the past few days and the letters say that they have failed to pay their notice on time. And if they don't pay it within a few days, they will get a late fee and their registration may be suspended. So that's in direct conflict with what I've been telling people. So constituents are calling me saying, you told us we won't have a late fee. The company is literally sending us a letter saying we have to pay it. And if we don't pay it in the next couple of days, there is a late fee and our vehicle registration may get suspended. I. Yesterday, I got a copy of a letter from a constituent who requested a hearing, a hearing date. In the mail yesterday on Monday, December 14th, he received notification that a hearing has been scheduled for Friday, December 11th, three days before that. We have seen tickets and violations issued at times when the cameras are not supposed to be working. And I thank Commissioner Helfer the one, there's a woman who emailed me a ticket that was issued at 7.23 in the morning and the cameras are not supposed to be turned on until 7.30 at that school location. So how are violations being issued when the cameras are not supposed to be on? I know last week we requested data for how many violations have been issued in times when they're not supposed to be on and we have not received that information yet. Um, at this point, I think it's important that we have a reduced speed limit during pickup and drop off times near schools for the safety of children. However, I have zero confidence in this vendor and I think it would be completely inappropriate for the city of Buffalo to continue in a contract 
with this vendor. And I think we should take the cameras down and return them to the vendor immediately. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pridgen, Council President yeah. Pridgen. Thank you. Um, the What is before us, Mr. Chair, is um, the resolution that I wrote that asked and uh, co-sponsored by Mr. White and Mr. Fairletto that asked Corporation Council to opine, I don't want to get away from this, on the validity of the tickets that have occurred uh, since the agenda was changed uh, since the agenda item of 2014-44 by Wyatt, um, in which signs were supposed to be moved out. Um, the Corporation Council has um, given me an opinion. I think it's important uh, that we hear from Corporation Council because what we have is we have Attorney Reese on, we have, out, have the city's attorneys, and I, I for one, uh, I, I am concerned that many of the tickets that were written really should be forgiven. And that those people, and, and part of the next resolution, which I won't bring up, but I think it's all going to get all into one ball of wax, is that those people should receive a refund uh, without having to inquire. Um, I'm going to be clear, and I think my both of my colleagues have been very clear, I, I am for changing behavior in school zones. This program has been rolled out horribly. Um, last week at a funeral, I, I was visited by an angry constituent with their ticket in hand. Not angry at the fact that they got the ticket, angry at the fact that they, they didn't know what to do. They've called, they've done everything. They're afraid, you know, am I going to lose my car? Am I going to, at the end of the day, I agree with council member Fairletto. Um, I think that this vendor, and so I'll, I'll get to a question now, that this vendor or whatever has happened, it is it, a horrible rollout. It doesn't mean that we get rid of the, the the school zones, but it could mean that these cameras need to go back to the vendor and we figure out a, a different way. Um, so I want to ask Corporation Council two things. One is right here in the in what why we're talking about this, the validity of the tickets since the agenda item changed, and then second of all, does the city have an out from this? Um, vendor is that built in to the contract cadet chamber senior deputy corporation council uh as to the first question the tickets are valid the tickets met the minimum requirements that were required under new york state law once that was met we could actually issue the tickets the enforcement the additional measures that the council requested do not invalidate those tickets because those additional measures are not put in place yet by way of the beacons, um, additional beacons being put in place a half a mile from the entrance of the school or whatever reasonable distance in between there. Um, because that is an additional measure. It does not mean that the minimum that is set by New York state law was not met. But so as long as we are in compliance with the law, then those tickets are in fact valid and can be collected. As to the second question with respect to the vendor, there is under the contract uh, two provisions. Uh, one provision speaks to the ability to terminate a contract for breach. What has occurred here is each and every time that we have notified the vendor that there is a problem with the services that they're providing, the vendor has worked to satisfy that, meaning that they have satisfied it in a way that takes them out of that breach. And they have 60 days from the time that they receive that notice in order to correct it. So as Commissioner Helfer says, each and every time that we go to them and we request something be changed or additional information, whatever it may be, the vendor is working with the city in order to correct that, um, whether it's the telephone numbers that were mistakenly um, printed or uh, to provide the clarity with respect, with respect to the null. Is there liability to the city in the event that the commissioner of parking and his authority decided that he did not want to continue this arrangement with this vendor? 
possibly and possibly not, that was going to be up to a court to decide. So I can't say definitively that there would be no liability, but what we have here is we have a contract between two parties, the city and the vendor. There is going to be a problem um, if an action is brought against the city, because if it's the case that the vendor can successfully argue that the city, after it has entered the contract, has taken steps that are not necessarily um, fair dealing with a, within the, the reality of what this contract is supposed to, how it's supposed to operate, they could find a court that finds in their favor. There are provisions in the contract right now as it stands that say that that should not happen. However, the court in its discretion could set that aside because it could find that they have put out a considerable amount of money by way of the time and expense involved with uh, the cameras and the installation. And the court could say that, city, you're going to pay for this. So the, um, and I'll be quick, Ms. Chair, I know we have people waiting. Um, speaking of fair dealing, I don't think this, this co company has been very fair uh, to our constituents. Um, and so, and this is just me speaking, so I really, the fair dealing portion of this, um, if, if it were fair, um, people wouldn't have received tickets late. If it were fair uh, dealing, then we wouldn't be having tickets that are issued uh, outside of the hours, as Mr. Fairletto has said, if it was fair, if all of this was fair, it's not fair. This whole thing is not fair at this point. Um, the, the words demonstration project are in the uh, legislation. Um, what, what, does, what does that refer to? What does that mean? Uh, this means that this is just, this is a new program. And if I can go back a little bit with respect to FAIR, that also means that they did make those corrections. So while you may feel as though in the, your constituents may feel that it was not fair for them to do so, they immediately did remedy the situation, which is what they're required to do under a contract. Well, how, long, how long does that go on? Does the next glitch, is it okay, well, they remedied that. And the next glitch, they remedied that, and it just continues to go on because they remedied it? Uh, the contract actually provides for 30 days notice and for them to, rem to remedy it within 60 days. They've been well ahead of that. I believe the commissioner said that they corrected it in 10 days, mm -hmm. not anywhere near the 30 or 60 days. So they are remedying the situation. And so can, and I'll be quiet so, Mr. after that, this, the demonstration project question. The demonstration is because this is, that's language that the legislature will use when this is a new program being rolled out. So does that also hint at trial? I, I would not use the word trial. I would just use the word new. It's new, it's a new opportunity. It's something that was not available previously. So it, it's available for a certain period of time. And then the legislature will look at it, how successful was this program, and then decide whether or not it would sunset the program or whether it would continue with the program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, we don't have any more of my colleagues. I think we have some people uh, that wanted to speak. I'm not sure. Um, in which order they signed up. Uh, if central staff has a list of the names uh, and can read them out. Uh, and just a reminder that you have approximately three minutes to be able to speak. Thank you. Michael Blake. Okay, Mr. Blake, welcome. Sorry it took so long. Oh, no problem. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank Council President Pridgen for the invitation to attend and speak before this committee. Our petition on change.org calling for an end to the school camera safety program has generated close to 4,000 signatures in one week. Residents of this city are very angry and are demanding action. We believe the blatant fleecing of its own residents out of their hard earned money in the midst of the COVID pandemic, where many residents are already facing financial hardship is morally reprehensible. Many of the victims of this scam are veterans, servers currently out of work, and senior citizens living on fixed incomes. 
This was a premeditated assault on the working poor and middle class residents of this city and the mayor and his administration should be ashamed of themselves. In addition to being morally reprehensible on the part of the Brown administra administration, the foreign vendor the city partnered with has proven to be grossly inept as everyone's been stating previously. As council member Golombic admitted in a recent TV interview, this whole thing has been a cluster I think he went, I think he meant to add something else to that, but he knew he was on TV. Missing signs, non-blinking signs, tickets issued on non-school days during non-school hours, the tickets themselves not meeting the legal standard for tickets in this state. We believe all these things taken together put the validity of every ticket in question. We have been advised, should this matter go to federal court, the citizens will have a credible case for every ticket to be thrown out. We plan on doing that if you don't. I urge this, I'm speaking. Uh, I urge the council to do the right thing and not let it get to that point. Put an end to this camera program right away, return the money taken from the citizens and get to work on real changes to get the city back on its feet financially. We will not let this go away. And I urge you to simply do the right thing and end this blatant money grab. And also we're seeking an apology from Mayor Byron Brown. Be a man, being a mayor is more than giving the key to the city to Terrell Owens. It's actually making tough decisions and working for the people. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Blake. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh... Yes, Mr. Chair, there were two additionals. However, they were by the invitation of Mr. Wyatt. I do not have their names. Okay. Um, Councilmember Wyatt, do you see if they are on? Uh... Ms. Young is one person that I see. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Miss or Mr. Miss Miss Young. Miss Young. Okay, Miss Young, you have the floor. If you could un unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Welcome to Chambers. Hey, good afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to thank Councilman Wyatt for the um the information that you share with the community. Um, I'm calling in regards again to the um, traffic violations or the speed zone bumps. And I just want to share my displeasure and I want to display, speak on behalf of the community and their displeasure. As all the speakers have spoke earlier today about the rollout of this, totally unprofessional, unfair to the community. The signage, not good. The blinking lights, not good. The, the contract, I mean, the um, postmark information had we not been informed by Councilmember Wyatt about the postmark we just would have been sending in her money I know somebody that sent in a hundred dollars because that's how responsible they are single parent but sent in that unfair totally now the as I'm listening to this um this meeting and the um, contract that you signed with this person to give them 30 days or 60 days to make do or to make it right not a good contract to make because you see how we're being treated. This is totally unfair. Um, my other issue is where does this money go to? And is this person that we have this contract with that's put up the campus, is that a out of, is that person even in the city of Buffalo? Is that contract with a person in the city of Buffalo or New York state? Is it a different state that's making money off what we have decided that we're going to do to protect our children. And no, let me not mistake this. We want our children to be protected. We definitely do. This is not, that's not what this issue is. Again, pandemic and you're asking for 50 bucks. This is an outrage. Everybody's not working. You know what I mean? But the way this thing was rolled out and it's upon us and now we got to deal with it. So now we got to go to a council member meeting to wait an hour to speak on behalf of the constituencies of this community. It is totally unfair, ridiculous. Um, what else I wanna say? Um, what about the school guards? They no longer work? This definitely appears to be a money grab. And we don't have money, especially at this time. We don't have $50 like that. I go down Bailey Avenue and I'm looking cause I know there's a sign, there's supposed to be a sign, I didn't see the signage. And then you have the nerve when kids are not even at school to ticket people. Do you know what it is to uh, mentally at this time to receive two, three, four tickets? 
upon the pandemic, upon not working, upon taking care of family members, for what? Where is this money going to? Is this to protect our children? Children are not even in school. So how is it to be protect our children when the children are not even in school? So what is not, so why does it, it appears to be a money grab. It appears to be. Where's the money going to? Is there another way that we can get people to obey the Lord other than reaching in their pocket? Is there another way? Is there another way? People move here from out of the town because of poverty, the rent, the, the housing, the market, because of our low income economy is low here. And you picking us 50 hit, $50, $50? You know what $50 is? $50 is a lot to some people, but to people who have jobs, maybe not a lot. So uh, the community is outraged and I understand the outrage. And I would like for something else to be done other than sitting in there, putting your hand in our pocket. And immediately, okay, here we go, tickets, 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 tickets. Everybody is not informed as y'all are. Yes, we should be, there should be responsibility in us too. I get that. I get that, but it's totally unfair. And we're, the community is outraged and I hear it and I see it, you know, and they're mad. They're mad, they're angry. And we shouldn't have a, 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 a council member or whoever decided this, you know, I, we should not be this angry about certain things, especially at this time. Where's the humanity at? We still in the pocket? We're just trying to save lives here. Where's the humanity? Is it all about money? Does it always come down to the dollar? To those that have and those that don't? You can't even, you can't even dream because you don't know nothing. You can't even dream forever because all you got to deal with is a freaking $50 ticket. So I thank you for the time. I thank for the time and the commitment that you do do. I do appreciate that. But this is totally unfair and we're outraged. And I hope I speak for all those individuals that are outraged, that don't have the time, don't even have the knowledge that they have the ability and the power to come and speak to y'all. It's not right. It's not right. So again, I wanna thank you for what it is that you sit in those chairs every day, but please show some humanity. It's not just money. It ain't, we're just not about money. That's all you can get from us is money. Where's the money going to? So are you going now? Our community got potholes in the street on Bailey. Is that money coming to us? Are we gonna have, well, what does that money do for us? Cause we're paying it. Cause we're now paying it. So where does that money benefit that you taking out our pockets? How does it come back and filter it back to us? Is it just to protect the children? That money protects them? That money protects them? How does it protect us that walk up and down that street every day? Do we get more police? Do we? Do we get more opportunities? What do we do with that money? Where does it go? Downtown, where does it go? So I want to again, thank you. I'm gonna let somebody else speak. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Y'all have a good day. Stay safe, wash your hands and wear your mask. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Ms. Young. Um, do we have another person? Mr. Wyatt, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I is Charles as someone that wants to speak? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't see another phone number. Okay, Charles S., if you wanted to speak, you're on a mute right now. Um, yeah, okay. I'd, I'd like to say something. I don't okay. have uh, my video, doesn't seem to be working. Okay, that's fine. Right. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. We hear you fine. Great. Um, yeah, I did send you a letter. I'm Charles Saunders. I own a company called Amthor Glass and Mirror. I know a couple of you folks might be familiar with me. We've been here for uh, quite a number of years. Um, and I'm just kind of speaking about the traffic on Bailey Avenue. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, there's been just, you know, there's a number of accidents that happened here. Um, bicyclists have lost their lives right here, right in front of my store in the block between Walden and Broadway. <clears throat> um, 
And I'd just like to see something done about uh, the, the crazy traffic that happens here. It's, it's, it's dangerous. Um, I've seen accidents. I've, my, my parking lot has been a site for triage. Uh, we um, notably of recent, and I know this is a citywide problem, but the, the band of all-terrain vehicle marauders that, that come through are, are like they just terrorize the street. They come down our street, they turn down Walden. Um, I don't know exactly what you've got planned, but um, <laughs> we got to do something. It's just crazy. Um, it's, it's, it's dangerous for pedestrians. My neighbor next door has had her business been hit. Uh, <clears throat> a neighbor house down the street was hit by a bus avoiding a drunk driver and the 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 traffic here i mean if there's a 30 mile an hour sign that the people are trying to go 50 or 60. Uh, i've talked to the police department a little bit offered my parking lot to um set up radar um but i just um i'm just hoping you can do something to calm the the streets down um, that's about all I got. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, is there anyone else that was to speak on this? Uh, Mr. Finn, Commissioner Finn. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, recognizing me, uh, Council Member Glombeck. Uh, and thank you, uh, I, I apologize, I, I forgot your last name, but uh, Charles, thank you for sharing your uh, concerns today with with Bailey Avenue because they they highlight some of the the challenges that that we're trying to deal with globally with traffic safety uh, across the city uh, because we we hear from uh, individuals business owners like yourself, um, Mr. Saunders. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Um, we, we hear from uh, individuals like yourself who are experiencing uh, traffic safety issues that that turn into you know, traffic violence uh, from time to time. And uh, Bailey Avenue is certainly a corridor that's on Public Works' radar. Uh, we, we have data that, that shows us that's the uh, highest incidence of crashes uh, for uh, the entire city. And um, that's known to us. And what we've done, the steps we've taken so far on that is uh, we've partnered with uh, the GBNRTC, which is a, a regional planning organization, uh, as well as the NFTA, and engaged in a study of what we can do to calm traffic. And the, the, the short answer on the results of, of that study is uh, that they're recommending a uh, three lane uh, road diet. Right now, Bailey Avenue uh, meanders from uh, an undefined one or two lanes uh, depend, you know, between Winspear and Kensington, I, I would say. Uh, and then as you get farther south along Broadway, it's clearly two lanes. Uh, but what we're seeing is that that's not ne uh, necessary for traffic and it's potentially, um, causing problems. So we are uh, seeking to uh, in, engender that uh, traffic calming road diet program. Uh, and that's something that I expect us uh, to see shortly. So thank you for uh, highlighting that today. And I'd be happy to speak further with you. And we'll definitely make sure, uh, Malcolm, if you could provide the contact information uh, for Mr. Saunders, we'll get him engaged in the public outreach that will happen uh, prior to that uh, traffic coming, going fully into effect. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, next, Commissioner Helfer. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanna clarify a couple of things that have come up. Um, uh, Council Member Wyatt talked about the times. Uh, the the um, compromise ordinance, I believe was passed on November 17th, if I'm not mistaken. On November 18th, we set every one of our beacons and all of our cameras to the compromise times. As a matter of fact, I think it's even more stringent than the compromise times. Um, at St. Joe's, for instance, we have the camera set at 7.30 in the morning, uh, which is a half an hour before school starts, and it goes to 9 o'clock, which is one hour after school starts. And then the reverse happens in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3.00. So I want to clarify that the beacons are on it. And I hear a lot of people say the beacons are off. The beacons are off in the middle of the day. 
They are absolutely off in the middle of the day. That was that was the reason we did that is because we said when the beacons are on, the cameras are on. So we set our beacons and our cameras to correspond at the same time. Uh, that's point one. Uh, point two, I, I'm not disputing when you, Council Member, why when you went to uh, Bailey Avenue that you didn't see anybody. But I can tell you, I go every day as well. Uh, about three weeks ago, I stopped and talked to the crossing guard that was there. And I asked her her opinion. Uh, and right as I was doing that, she was crossing two children and a lady across the street. Uh, and I said to her, what are you seeing? Are you seeing improvement? She says, I am seeing some improvement, but they're still going very fast. Um, the data I presented yesterday clearly shows that compliance is going up. And on Bailey Avenue, it's the highest compliance of any school zone in the city of Buffalo. And it's gotten as high as 96%. So to me, uh, the school zone safety camera program uh, is absolutely working. Um, Council Member Pridgen, you mentioned refunds without having to inquire, and I agree with you. I agree with you a thousand percent. Um, uh, we know that there was an issue with tickets going out after the 14 day, 14 business day statutory timeframe. Uh, that came to my attention on December 3rd. Uh, got some emails, got some constituent calls late in the day. I said, no, that doesn't look real good, but that's only a couple. The next day, Friday, saw more got a hold of the vendor, worked all weekend long to identify the problem. We did identify the problem. And over 19,000 notices have gone out. Um, so a lot of people have not inquired and they received these notices in the mail saying that their tickets will be dismissed. For those who paid, I agree with you as well. They should not have to inquire for their refund. Um, they should absolutely not have to inquire. Um, they're in the process right now, uh, if they were paid with a credit card of reversing that. Uh, if people paid with a check, that's going to take a little bit longer, but not much longer, and they're going to uh, send a check back uh, to that constituent. So I could not agree with you more. And um, and I don't blame them for inquiring. I would inquire too. Um, you know, they, they inquire by calling um, the, the 855 number. They inquire by calling 311. They inquire by calling your offices. Um, they inquire by calling my offices. Uh, so we get a lot of inquiries. Um, and what I would say to the people who are listening is, um, please be patient. Uh, I understand. I understand the concerns completely. I understand the delays. I don't like them any more than anybody else. Um, but if your ticket was issued in error, uh, we are remedying that, and we are remedying that on our own. We are not waiting for people to call us. Um, so I think that's very important. You know, Councilmember Ferrelato asked a couple of questions as well. Um, and look, I'm not passing blame, but the, the one, uh, we talk a lot, the one gentleman that uh, called today that, that had um, his notice delivered in the mail after the hearing date, um, it took the US Postal Service eight days to get that letter out. And those are some of the problems that we are having right now. Uh, so we're gonna work with um, our vendor. We're gonna move some of our deadlines so that we don't have things crossing in the mail. That is exactly what's happening now because of mail delays. It's causing a lot of confusion, but we will work to rectify that problem as well. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that any questions or concerns that were raised last week, any questions or concerns that were raised this week, I will always, as you know, give you the factual answer to the best of my ability. No tickets have been issued on holidays. Uh, and if somebody has a ticket to issued on a holiday, please show me. Um, that has absolutely not happened. Um, no tickets have been issued to schools that are closed. That has not happened. Now we can disagree whether BPN, and we know it's not a school, but we know it is a daycare. We know it is a compliance with the law. Um, so, you know, for trying to just set the record straight, but if people have something where I'm wrong, please bring it to my attention. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone else that wanted to, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, you know you've been a straight shooter with me. I, I, I respect that about you. Um, but I just want to ask you a couple of questions because I'm, I just want to be clear. Are the, are the beacons tied to the camera? So when the beacons are on, the camera is engaged for whatever time that you have? Or are they separate? They are two separate programs. We, we internally have the program where myself and my staff program the beacons. 
The cameras are done by our vendor, Census Gatso. Okay. So, 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 okay, so that's a separate system. Who coordinates the days that these schools are, when the days the schools are closed? Because there are residents who get tickets, who know for a fact that they tell me that this school was closed this day, but they ended up getting the ticket. Who coordinates that? How do we know for a fact? Because I know the charter school and St. Joseph's, they're not public, well, they're public. They're private and public schools, but who coordinates that data to make certain that if St. Joseph's was closed on Monday, that they're not, people aren't getting tickets on Monday? Yeah, it, Council Member, that's, that's an excellent question. And, and I think we're, we're wrapping our arms around that even better now. But to answer your question from the beginning of the program, one of the things we did is we went to every school's website and we got a list of their calendar. We also called the schools, but we, it's pretty hard to call every day. And there are gonna be instances happening where we're not aware and we're trying to tighten up that level of communication right now. And I'll, and I'll explain that in a second. But when I say there's gonna be instances we're not aware, uh, something could happen between now and tomorrow at a school that's open, uh, a COVID positive case where the school shuts down. So the beacons go on in the morning, the cameras go on in the morning, but then we find out later that that school was closed. Um, that citation should never go out. And that citation it, for the most part never would go out uh, because we would call the vendor immediately and say, what is ever in your, whatever violations that you have in your queue, invalidate them. And even if they didn't, we have the checks and balances on our side to invalidate it as well. Um, so, so we're trying very hard to even make this better now. Commissioner Finn has sent a letter to all the principals as well, uh, asking them exactly what their school hours are, asking them uh, if they have certain events and setting up a communication system where if they are gonna be closed on a day that, you know, we obviously know school would be closed on Thanksgiving or you know federal holidays, but on other days for some other reason that we might not know off the top of our heads that they are communicating with either his office or my office. But, but just that that statement by itself is what the, the part where the public is has questioned. And I think, you know, I appreciate Ms. Young's comment. She's the um, vice president of the University District Block Club Coalition. So she hears from those residents and many of them are seniors. And so her passion came through because there are people who are seniors and you, you've addressed one of them in our district um, that got two tickets um, that you helped her with. And, and people are like, you know, how do we know? I mean, this per, this resident that told me that they got a ticket and the day that they got a ticket in front of St. Joe's, their child goes to St. Joe's and knew the school was closed. So nobody else would know that. So I guess, you know, it, it is, it's really important. I know Dr. Cressy's earlier talked about communication, communication, but this is a hard sell because now people, they, they hear this and they, they hear what's going on and they see that it's not free flowing. It's not as connected as it should be. And they're getting tickets and they're, the tickets aren't truly justified, but how do they know they can even dispute it? People have disputed the, the beacons being on. And that's a question that I bring to you again, those beacons, you say the beacons are on, but commissioner, there are so many people that get four and five tickets in the same location. You got, I can't believe they saw the beacons on. The beacons can't be on. Cause I just can't believe someone would, as much as this has been in the news, that they will be driving and see the beacons on and be still driving and speeding. I mean, now one ticket or two tickets, yeah, but four, five, six tickets. Even Miss, the lady I told you about that lives in my district said she didn't see a beacon. I didn't see a beacon on. And so when I hear that you have to turn the beacon on and it's not actually connected to the camera, then that just brings more questions than anything. Council okay. member, let me clarify. We do not turn the beacon on. What I said is we program the beacon. The, pre the beacons are programmed to go on at a certain time. Um, they're programmed in advance. Um, if we get notice of a school closing, then we will go in and adjust that program. But right now they are pre-programmed. What I will tell you is the first thing I do every single morning, because I come down to city hall, we're public service, as you know, a lot of constituents are coming in. As you know, we talked about today, a lot of hearings. Um, the first thing I do every morning is go by every school district. It's the first thing I do. I live probably 15 houses from St. Joseph's. I turn right off my street, right into that school zone every single day. 
I look at that beacon. I look at every, I turn left on Bailey. I go to Bailey. The beacons are on there. I look at that beacon. I could tell you my exact route uh, and cut over to Colvin Avenue, from Colvin Avenue to go down to, to, to Delaware. Um, and then uh, eventually to get to Abbott Road, which just came back online uh, yesterday. Um, every day I look at those beacons. Um, I believe the confusion, and I'm, it's no blame of anybody. Like I said, the beacons, the mayor had said at the beginning, I want the beacons to go on. And if the beacons are on, that means the cameras are on. But right now, as you know, the beacons go on, like I said, for using St. Joseph's example, for an hour and a half in the morning, then they go off for a significant amount of time, then they come back out of the afternoon. So when a lot of people say to me, you know, I went by St. Joe's, the beacon wasn't on. And I'll say to them, well, what time did you go by St. Joe's? And they'll say 11 o'clock. I say, that's right. It's not on. Um, because as you know, the program started with all day. Then we went to the bookends. I think, uh, well, I don't have anything else. But I, I thank you for your comments, Commissioner. And um, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, Mr. Pridgen, yes? I'll be brief. Um, and the gentleman who spoke who said I invited him on, I invited him on because we were having a spirited discussion. I'll call it spirited. And he was uh, mistaken on some things of what he thought this council was not doing. Um, so um, I want to be clear of why I invited him on. It was about uh, him understanding uh, what the council was doing. My, my final question, and because again, what is in front of us is about the inquiry uh, and for Corporation Council. Corporation Council, this council has been asked by many constituents to either pause this program, give a grace period for this program, or to stop it. Does this council have the ability to do either of those through with the contract we have right now? To that chamber, senior deputy corporation council, um, as to a pause of the program, the answer is no. Under article 24 of the state law, the ability to pause local laws during a emergency, which is what we are currently under, is vested in the mayor of the city of Buffalo. So Mayor Brown has the ability to pause local laws. With respect to the um, repealing, which is what the council has authority to do, uh, that, uh, as we discussed before, um, would not be recommended by this office. And the reason being is that the city has conducted its study of the effects of not having an enforcement mechanism in place in the school zones. We have now taken the steps that are available under the state law to allow for enforcement in the school zones by way of adopting this program. If the council were to repeal it, then the city would now be open to immeasurable liability for anyone who has a motor vehicle accident on our roadways in the school zones. Um, because we have, and there's long standard case law at the highest level of the courts here, being a court of appeal going back from 1960, and more recently as even 2016 in New York City that when, when a governmental entity takes steps and knows that there is a known hazard, where here we are aware of that because the uh, parking commissioner has put forth all the data showing that, what compliance was at the beginning of the program being 34%, what the compliance is right now being 94%, what we now have even further by way of this meeting, discussions for one of our more highly traveled roads and the instances on Bailey Avenue where he has now confirmed that that is at 96%. So we see in the law department, we have the records of motor vehicle accidents that happen in the city of Buffalo and we're averaging roughly around a thousand per month. When we're looking at that and we have taken the steps as this administration has done, the common council working with the mayor, working with the commissioner of um, 
of parking and DPW to put enforcement measures that would help us to um, limit the possibility of citizens and children and motorists that are operating on our roadways that we would help to enforce the fact that when you're in a school zone, you need to slow down. And that is right now we're at this 15 miles per hour. That is a mechanism that once you remove it, there is not that we can find a reasonable or rational basis that the city would do that because then that means that the city is saying, yes, I know that prior to this, prior to this availability under state law and that I've taken the steps to adopt locally, I, I, I did not know prior to this or I had suspicion that this was a problem in these areas, but now you have data supporting that problem. So once you have taken the steps to remedy it, the question then becomes, if an accident were to occur, why did you decide not to? Because while we may be um, talking, and this is not limiting the concerns of anyone who has spoken on this call or the citizenry who is upset about the fee that's aligned with this program, what this has done is caused a 94% compliance for people to slow down and not endanger the lives of the citizens, not endanger the lives of those that operate, that move through our city, whether they're city residents or they're not city residents or whether they're pedestrians or school children. So the ability to step back and say that you don't want to do this, um, there, from what I understand to be the issues, I don't, I cannot say that I find that there is a rational basis to repeal it because the greater harm is to the greater community that we are dealing with and the greater risk of one child being one child too many. Um, one parent, one anybody being a life being one too many especially when you now are fully aware of what the benefits are of this program. And the benefits are a 94% and in some areas of the city, a 96% compliance in a program that the state late legislature said, you have the availability, availability to do this, so you are actually taking active steps to say, city of Buffalo, all city residents, everyone that travels our roadways, we are now doing what we are aware of, where, where we see this fact, we see these how these numbers have been going, and these numbers are going even during a pandemic. So what more compliance that you are moving in with a smaller group right now that the commissioners present have said that they are going to take the steps necessary to even allow for more enforcement, more notice. So this is more ability for anyone who travels our streets to say, do not mow down my child or my grandchild. Um, I appreciate I asked a question about whether we have the ability. I wanna be clear, this is not about mowing down anybody's child. This is about a company where the rollout has been bad. I wanna be clear because I got everything you said, but rather disappointed with the end to make it seem as if asking that question or asking about uh, putting a pause is about mowing down a child. That's number one. If this liability is there, if, the, if this program was put on pause, then why is the liability different when there is an agreement with the administration to go from all day to two hours before and two hours after? That was a change. I want to ask the question maybe in a different way without hearing about mowing down a child, because this council has been very clear that we are here for safety. This council has been very clear that we we support it. Obviously, we voted for it. This is about business. And this is about now bringing a, a company on notice by being able to pause something until it is fixed. I want to be clear of what my question is. 
can this council, and if it cannot, and if you cannot advise me in that way, then I think this council needs to hire a attorney to hear some other sides. My question is, does this council have, you said that you said the mayor has the ability to pause this in an emergency that would be due to COVID. What we've heard from people is about COVID and, and the fact that we have a lot of people who are out of work, yada, yada. So you said the mayor has the ability, the council does not. That was that was really what, I, what, what you said, I believe. The question is, does the council have the legal authority in any way, I'll ask a different way, to challenge this contract as far as with the contractor we have without having to wait a month to get a change? First, let me apologize for how um, my tone was perceived. Um, this was really from the extensive research that I've been doing and really after reading the 2016 case, which was about a child being um, severely harmed um, because of actions. So please accept my apology for my passion and um, about that you also share and I receive that. With respect to your question as to whether or not you can repeal it was what the action, I'm sorry, with respect to your question is about what you can do about the contract itself. The ability to terminate that contract vests with the department head. The council approved the contract. The administration of contracts vests with each department head who is responsible for that contract. So that's not a power that's with the council. That is a power that is vested with the, with the department head and a collaborative effort. Now that we know, I'm sorry, not that now that we know, the council has made itself clear on the concerns that it has with the contractor. If the department head decided that he wanted to exercise his rights that are reserved under the contract, that department head could do so. But based on the separation that you have now between the legislative body and the executive body, the legislative body has acted in approving the contract. Now we're on to the administration of that, which is done by the department head. Does okay. that answer your yeah, question, that sir? That perfectly answers my question. I wanted the public to hear that and understand it, the council to understand it, that the department head, sorry, uh, commissioner, um, has the ability or the mayor, the administration to put this on hold. So it sounds as if if we wanted this to be, um, and I don't mean the, the school speed areas, I'm not talking about getting rid of the safety areas, but that then this council would have to appeal then to our commissioner or to the administration to put this on hold? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, okay, thank uh, you- Mr. Uh, Carolato and then Mr. Wingo. You can go ahead. I. You can go ahead to Council Member Wingo. Okay, uh, Council Member Wingo and then Carolato. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to everyone who shared today their sentiments. Uh, thank you to all of the legal experts, Mr. Reese and all of the other counselors uh, who practice law, who can interpret the law or argue the law articulately. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Counselor uh, Cavers, Tra Travers for her, her input. Um, and uh, again, November 6th, I said this before, November 6th in the Maston District, a young man was severely injured when he was run over by a car in a school zone, uh, crossing the street, uh, fractured skull, broken collarbone, broken femur. The individual in the car was allegedly going about 35 miles an hour. The difference, if I could just say this, between 35 miles an hour and 25 miles an hour is if someone lives or dies or is severely injured to the point where they're laying up in ECMC in a coma. The conversation has gotten away from the safety of our families and residents and pedestrians and bicyclists to 
this money grab situation, when we are looking at compliance rates in the upwards of 94, 95, and 96%, which means people are slowing down. And if you're already going 30 miles an hour, it's not a heavy lift to slow down to 25 miles an hour before you get a ticket to potentially save someone's life. I think this $50 is a, a reminder that someone's life is at stake, whether we're driving 35, 30 miles an hour versus 25 or 20 miles an hour. Uh, I do have to agree though, that the vendor has not done a very good job thus far. I do have to agree that uh, some of these tickets do appear to be invalid, unjustified. They appear to be that way. But again, if I've learned anything in this area, uh, as far as politics is concerned, nothing is as of what it seems right off the bat. People have agendas, people have motives, ulterior motives, and there's always two sides to every story. So I want us to be very, very clear that um, the program is in place for safety. And I am very, very disappointed uh, that the conversation keeps going left. Uh, and, and, I, and I do hear the argument that folks don't have the money during this time to pay these bills, uh, especially if they believe that tickets are invalid. So with that said, again, uh, in the Masson District, we have been, you know, encouraging our residents to submit the tickets for a hearing so that we can appear with them, so that we can see and hear both sides of the story. But I don't think we need to threaten anyone's job uh, when they are legal experts uh, regarding how they, um, you, don't have to, you don't have to apologize for your passion but I do believe that um, I've, I've, I've said things over the course of five years that have gotten me in a lot of trouble as well, but I don't think it, it, it warrants threatening someone's job uh, because of that. And if anyone or if anyone is going to accept or not accept the apology that was given, I do accept that apology because I've learned a thing or two about forgiveness and letting things go moving forward, letting things be water, let it being water under the bridge. So with that being said, if there is something we can do to ensure that um, the program is being executed and implemented uh, better, then as a council, let's, let's try to do that. Let's try to do that uh, because folks are feeling the pain already. They're feeling the, 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 the effects of this pandemic and me personally, I've fielded so many phone calls and I've spoken to a lot of constituents who, who for, the, for, for, for whatever reason, believe that I, I'm in love with this program. Uh, I, I'm not in love with the program. I'm in love with the premise of the program, which is to help us change the behaviors of those drivers who, who are not uh, being responsible drivers in the city of Buffalo. I'm, I'm really uh, in, in, uh, happy with the premise of the fact of this program, of the fact that uh, we need to make sure that we hold people accountable for driving reckless when there's a potential for folks to be, to be injured and hurt. And uh, with that, we need to do everything we can to protect the citizens in the city of Buffalo, our most vulnerable population, our children. And if you didn't know, yes, I did um, make, uh, I did serve in the Buffalo Public Schools for about 14 years, from 2001 to 2015. And yes, we do take our children out of the school. And yes, we do cross the streets with our children. Yes, we do uh, uh, utilize the playgrounds in the area. So, I mean, even when the schools are in session and children are typically in the classroom, there are going to be students who are going to be in the community as well. So I'm hoping that we continue to make sure that this is about the safety of our students. Uh, and again, too, with a compliance rate 
and upwards of 94, 95, and 96 percent. I'm praying that we can find a way to make uh, this program work with all of the complaints I've had in the last five years. Uh, all of the complaints I've had regarding speeding up and down streets. We have all of these schools in these residential areas. Um, I think that we need to do everything we can to slow drivers down. And I appreciate the time, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you. Um, Mr. Ferraletto or Mr. Pridgen wanted to speak. Do you want him no, to go Mr. first? I can wait till Mr. Ferraletto speaks. Sure. Let me let me be clear. Um, the Nobody's job was threatened. So I want to be clear in what I just said and why I said it. Because today I had meetings with council members who are trying to figure out if because our corporation council, which is wonderful, um, but we, we do understand that there are so, only so many things that they can handle at one time. And this council, as the legislative body, does have the ability to hire counsel when it needs it for a bigger issue. That's number one. So I want to be clear about that, uh, that nobody's job was threatened. My statement was about this council, which is a legislative body, having other legal advice when we have a large issue like this, the same way that the administration does when they have legal issues that they have to deal with. So let me be clear. Um, and to the second point, on the, I, I do appeal um, to the administration that we should, that I would love uh, to meet to talk about whether there could be a longer grace period, uh, whether there could be a some type of way where we are continuing to change behavior. But in the midst of a pandemic, just as we have put moratoriums on rent, for instance, moratoriums all over when it comes to the financial burden. I wanna be clear, we're not going around what we need to talk about. The item that is before us is not about whether people drive 30 miles an hour. The item that is before us is not whether they drive 20 miles an hour. The item that is before us that I wrote that Council Member Wyatt and Fioletto also sponsored is an inquiry into the school speed zone camera program with very specific requests that is what is before this common council right now, just to be clear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Mr. Ferraletto. You know, you're good? I'm all set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no one else left to speak, I believe we, um, we should have a motion to table this item. That's fine, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I couldn't unmute. Okay, motion is to table, seconded uh, by Mr. Pridgen. Next item, please. Item number seven, review and refund of invalid school speed zone citations. Items uh, open? Yeah, this item's open. I think that we've sort uh, we've spoken to this. I don't think we need to, uh, Mr. Wyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to, if the commissioner could just speak again, because um, I know there's a lot of people who still have questions that they haven't been able to have a hearing. So are we saying to them that if they were outside the 14 days, they need not request a hearing, that you will send out a letter to them regarding that, that particular ticket? What I'm saying is uh, our vendor will send a letter. Okay. And, and we got to be clear, um, and I know there's a little confusion, it is 14 business days. And, and obviously, you know, that, that Saturday and Sunday certainly don't count, but holidays as well. So I want to be very clear. Um, if people feel that it, that, that we, they might call my, they might call 311, they might call my office, they might call the vendor. If they feel like they're not getting the correct information, they should absolutely request a hearing. Um, and and, it, and it, the point came up today. We will have the mailing affidavits there of notice, um, and that will solve that issue of when was the postmark. So the admission that the 20,000 tickets were outside of that 14 days, I'm speaking of those people. So you said 14 business days, but that's in the legislation, but you've already, it's already been admitted that 20,000 tickets went out that were outside the 14 days, correct? Uh, right now, we're looking at about 19,750 tickets that 
will either be invalidated or about 700 to 800 of them will not only be invalidated, will get re refunds that were outside the 14 business days. So those 19,000 don't have to do anything. They're going to get a letter from the vendor and they right. fine. And what I was trying to say, what I was trying to explain is some people might think they were outside the 14 days that aren't. And if they think that, it does not hurt them to have to ask for a hearing is all I'm saying. And, and they can do a hearing, uh, an ex parte hearing, where they can send in their what they believe is their, their proof without having to come in. And the other thing that we're starting to set up now, and it's going to take a little bit of time. When we started this program, there was obviously no pandemic. Uh, we certainly didn't envision that we could have telephone hearings with people. But we do now know, and we certainly respect myself more than just about anybody, that some people do not want to come in to City Hall. And I totally respect that. Some people want to stay away from other people. I totally respect that. We have got to get that, that, that part of this process going where we can do phone hearings. We're already doing that on the parking ticket side. Now we have to translate that and do that on the school zone safety uh, camera program side as well. So how do we get that communication out? Because again, there are a lot of people who are connected that can get yeah. the information out, but then there are people who are connected yeah. who feel like they're under the gun because they have this deadline to pay that ticket. Understood completely. I, a meeting with my, uh, like I said, every day at 4.15, we, we meet with the vendor. I will bring that up today um, and I will see what that universe of potential people that that could be. And maybe we get a letter out to them explaining all that. So they don't have to. So those people, and just speaking to the 19,750 people you're talking about, they don't have to do anything. They'll get a letter. And so they won't be under any pressure to pay a ticket. Now, are they going to get additional letters? Because I know Councilmember Fioretto said there are people still getting additional letters, even though this is going on. Look, that, that letter is going to trump every letter and people are going to get, sometimes people are getting additional letters because of what I said before. The mail delivery system has got some delays built into it. So so here's the example I used when I talked to council member Fair Little earlier today. A person gets a ticket on, I'm just being hypothetical, uh, November 15th. They got 30 days to respond to that ticket. All of a sudden on, on, on December 13th, they mail something in saying, I want to have a hearing. By the time that gets postmarked, by the time that gets delivered, it could be around Christmas time. Well, in that same period of time, they have now passed their 30 day notice to pay and are getting a second notice. So we've got mail crossing. That's another thing that I'm gonna talk about the vendor today delaying on our side. Uh, these are things that really could not be foreseen. I'm not making excuses, I never do, um, but I, I'm acknowledging the fact that uh, you know, with COVID, with the pandemic, with the mail system, things are different than what we expected, and we will try to make those adjustments. So, so Commissioner, if they can't get on the website, if they can't um, be able to get a hearing, how else can they request a hearing if they can't get online, if they can't get a phone call back? Is there another way that they can get a hearing requested? Yes, uh, what, what, what a lot of people have done is to take the burden off of, of census gap. So uh, we, we earlier last week said, please call 311 as well. Those calls get to my office. I will acknowledge that that is a huge burden on us. I've got all hands on deck. Um, I'm dealing with some COVID issues here as well in our office. Once again, no excuses, just the facts. Um, and as we know, we got a lot of people working at home because they have young children that they have to take care of as well. So we're not quite 100% as efficient as I would like to be, but we're doing the very best we can and we will get back to that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, I don't know, should we receive and file or table this, uh, whatever the... Can we table? Table, okay, motion is to table, seconded by Mr. Rivera. Motion to adjourn. And motion to adjourn, seconded by Mr. Wingo.